Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 to 42. A lot of you have probably heard people say, Jesus needs to be first in your life. And I've taught in the past that Jesus should not only be first, but also central, right? Central to your life so that he's a part of everything in it. And, you know, that's completely and totally true. And, and we should remember that. But today we're on a passage that talks about loving Jesus more than anything. And so we're going to focus on the Jesus being first part. I love the lyrics of the old hymn, Fairest Lord Jesus. Uh, my brother-in-law actually reminded me of it when we were in Ontario. And it talks about how amazing creation is and how, you know, brightly the stars shine. But it, it says of how even more, it talks about how even more, even better than, you know, the beautiful creation itself is the creator, right? It says, fair are the meadows, fairer still the woodlands robed in the blooming garb of spring. Jesus is fairer. Jesus is purer who makes the woeful heart to sing. Fair is the sunshine, fairer still the moonlight and all the twinkling starry host. Jesus shines brighter. Jesus shines purer than all the angels heaven can boast. As Christians, we have come to know the greatest being in all existence, the one true God himself, as of course Jesus is God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who is so powerful that he created everything in, 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 in all of existence, right? The heavens, the earth, the galaxy, the universe, all of it. And so he has more power than everything in the universe combined. Nothing can come close to him and he's also, at the same time, so loving that he became human and he went to the cross, went to a death of such humiliation. Think of God who wants to be worshipped coming to a death of such humiliation and also a death of, of course, unbelievable agony, crucifixion. He did that to open a way for us to be forgiven of our sins and saved from hell and so that we could have eternal life with him. Jesus is the best, the absolute best. And he needs to be what we treasure the most. And if we believe who he is and what he's done for us, how can he not be, right? How can he not be what we treasure most? But we don't physically see him and his work, right? And we have very forgetful minds and we get easily distracted by what, by what we can physically see. We get distracted by all these things and we still also have sinful flesh that's corrupted, it, corrupted us in, in such a way that it wants to push us away from Jesus. So we need help. We need help. We always need help. And... The good thing is, though, as believers, as children of God, we do have help. We do have that because of his spirit that now lives in us. So we got to remember that we can ask for help. Remember that we can rely on the spirit's help as we, you know, fight those feelings that don't want God, as we fight those heart motives that want to do what's against his ways, and as we strive to keep him central in our lives and first in our hearts above all else. So today's words here in this passage, they're good words, but they are words that are, you know, hard for our flesh to hear. But when you go through the Bible, when you go through the truth, of course, the truth is not always easy to hear. But we don't want to skip anything. We don't want to just skip something because it's hard to hear. We want to look at it because it is important, right? This is important stuff. Now, Jesus is still teaching his 12 disciples. So the words that we read in this passage are spoken directly to them, to the 12 disciples. But as we read through, of course, you'll see words like whoever and everyone, meaning that this teaching is not just for them. It's for whoever. It's for everyone. So with that said, let us read Matthew 10, verses 32 to 42. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. 
But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he's a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is righteous will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he's a disciple, truly I say to you, will by no means lose. He will by no means lose his reward. God, I thank you so much again um, for, again, everything you've done. You are so good. You are so, so, so good to us. I need you so much. Um, there's always a need for you in everything. And so be with me and be with each one of us uh, as we hear your word. Give us understanding of your word in the name of Jesus. Give us um, just what we need to hear from it. And if we're challenged, I just pray that uh, we would actually take that to heart, Lord. And uh, so encourage us where we need to be encouraged for sure but challenge us where we need to be challenged as well, um, if that is the case. And of course I pray, because I, I, don't, I don't always get everything right. I just want to pray that if I do say anything that might be wrong or might be untrue, I just pray that that would not be believed in the name of Jesus. I don't want to mess anything up with your truth, Lord. I want to say what is true. I want to teach your truths. I want what is true to be understood and believed, Lord. And so I pray that that would be the case in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, again for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. And I pray this all in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. So the tone of this passage at first glance, it seems to give us the impression that maybe family isn't important. Maybe people aren't important. Only Jesus is important. But by the end of the passage, we see that that is so far from the from what is the case, right? People are so important. Family is so very important, so much so. It's a, it's a false statement to say that only Jesus is important. But from that statement, if you take away one word while adding one more word, one more word, you'll get the truest statement in every part of life. Jesus is more important. Now, the first thing Jesus says in verses 32 and 33 is, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Jesus is our advocate, right? We're only allowed into heaven because his righteousness, his right standing with the Father has been imputed to us, right? It's been placed upon us. And that became the case when in repentance we placed our faith in him and what he did for us on the cross and in his resurrection, right? No longer is our identity in our sinfulness. To God, we are now represented by the perfect righteousness of Christ, the perfect goodness of Christ, the man who never sinned who never did wrong in the eyes of God. We deserve the punishment of death for the sins we've committed, but the sinless man Jesus, he says about us believers, Father, their penalty I have taken, right? Their punishment was taken by me on the cross. And so he acknowledges us before the Father. He acknowledges us, right? He is our advocate. But, of course, those who deny him, as it says here, are denied, right? Jesus denies them before the Father. 
Now we know that yes, those who accept Jesus through faith are accepted into heaven, and those who reject Jesus are rejected from heaven. They deny Jesus, and so they are denied heaven. But the thing is, what this, partic- what this particular passage is talking about, it's not exactly that. Like that, those are true statements, but that's not exactly what this is getting at. It's driving at something even more specific. It's not just talking about a person denying Christ in their heart. This is talking about specifically denying him in front of other people, which, of course, those who deny him in their heart, they do that. But at the same time, it's not unnatural or unheard of for us who know Jesus to have the urge to deny him in order to, you know, avoid trouble or to avoid harm. I mean, I mean, it's natural just to want to avoid trouble and avoid harm, right? We see later on in Matthew that on the night before Jesus' death, Peter, his disciple, says, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. And I think that's sometimes what sometimes what uh, we say, you know, I would never deny Jesus, even if I must die. Well, here is Peter who saw all the miracles that Jesus did who knew Jesus when he was walking on the earth, right? Peter saw him face to face and he spent around three years with him like that. He could talk to him and get a direct, audible reply. And remember our passage today is a passage when Jesus was directly teaching the 12 disciples. So Peter was right there when Jesus said, whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my father. Of course, those words are for everybody. It's a teaching for everybody. But right then and there, in that moment, those words were spoken to the disciples, right? They were directed at the disciples. And so they were directed at Peter. But when Jesus gets arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, Peter does try to help, right? He tries to fight. He tries to defend Jesus to the point where even a servant's ear actually gets cut off. But Jesus doesn't want his help. And so Jesus goes off eventually to his death. And Peter, after that, after Jesus is arrested, naturally wants to avoid trouble. So the end of Matthew 26 tells us now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him and she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly, you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. This is Peter. This is Peter, the rock on whom Christ built his church, his church that, will, that the gates of hell will not prevail against. This is Peter. And we see him deny Jesus. Not once, not twice, but three times. Whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my father. Maybe you find those words scary, And to a degree, they should raise some alarm, right? They really should, because they're not words to take lightly. But when we think that Christ still decided to build his church upon the disciple who had previously denied him three times, I think there is some comfort, some level of comfort that we can take away from that, right? God's forgiveness doesn't turn its back on the one who is truly repentant. There's so many times where We react poorly to situations where we do stuff that is not great. 
But I think when we think of this passage, whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my father. I think this is an interesting diagnosis of your heart. You know, because it's one thing, it's one thing to like, this is a crazy scenario, but it does happen sometimes. It's one thing to have a gun to your head and have the person ask you, you know, do you believe in Jesus? It's one thing to be in that situation. Of course, I've never been in that situation. And though I, I know what I believe and I know what I should say in that situation, right? The answer is yes. I just wonder sometimes, you know, would I actually do that? Would that actually be what comes out of my mouth in that situation? I'm 95% I'm sure that it would be, but of course, with the stress, right, and the fear that comes out of that situation, I don't know. I don't know. Of course, I just hope that never happens at all, but, you know, I don't know. But then again, let's say that you're in a non-life-threatening situation, right? A non-life-threatening circumstance. And, and you're, you know, maybe in a group of people, maybe old friends who don't really like religion and stuff. And to be approved in their eyes, you all of a sudden change your tune completely. And you go, yeah, I don't believe all that Jesus stuff. If that's you, then you really need to check your heart. You really do. That would definitely make me wonder, you know, do you actually know Jesus? Because these are strong words. Jesus is not someone to take lightly. When you came to Christ, did you actually surrender your life to him? Was your faith in him genuine? Because if that's your behavior, just to turn on him like that, just to impress people, like, that behavior would suggest that it probably isn't genuine. It would suggest that Maybe you're not really, maybe you don't really know him. Our attitude should be like the attitude of Paul, who says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then also to the Greek, which is the, the Gentile. Don't be ashamed of your faith in Christ. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. Sure, there are shameful things that, you know, some people make Christ out to be. But the true Jesus, he's no one to be ashamed of. The next thing that Jesus says to his disciples, verse 34, is, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. So Jesus knows that his message and his mission, they're not going to be popular, right? And, and that's an understatement. And sometimes we see that today too, right? Families get divided over Jesus, Someone in a family, you know, comes to know Jesus and they're changed, they're transformed, and maybe some of the family is supportive. Others maybe just don't really care, right? But oftentimes, others become very, very opposed and the relationship is just not the same, right? Sometimes, and like this happens too, sometimes people even get disowned from their families because of their newfound faith. So instead of peace between families... With Jesus, there comes tension and uneasiness and division. And that's not to say that other things don't cause divisions inside of a family, of course. right? There's many things that cause division. But for a lot of families, Jesus is one of those reasons. Because many hearts don't want anything to do with him. But if a person is forced to choose family or Jesus... We certainly never hope for that ever, right? And we certainly want to do all we can to reconcile if that does turn out to be the case. But if, you know, that's not possible and things do end up going that way, bringing you to this, this fork in the road that says family or Jesus, then, well, I mean, we can see even in the next words, it says, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's what Jesus says. Now, this, of course, these words that I just read, of course, they don't mean 
at all that you neglect your family members. Not at all, right? Cherish them, love them dearly, treasure them greatly. Pray for them constantly as well. But Jesus is still first, right? Jesus is still to be of more value to you, to be of more worth. And so when we think of, again, that context of what we were just talking about, you know, the situation of a family so divided by Christianity that the choice is left to Jesus or them, then, well, the choice is Jesus, right? The choice is Jesus. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. When you become a Christian, life is now about Jesus, right? It's about loving Jesus. It's about serving Jesus, sharing Jesus. And that kind of life can be a very hard one at times, for sure. Not only do many people dislike Christians, but sometimes it's also the people that you're so close to, right? Still, though, we take our cross and we follow Jesus, right? We don't turn our back and leave Jesus behind. No, we cling to our faith in him. We don't shrink back. Hebrews 10 verse 37, for yet a little while and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Who are we? We are not those who shrink back. We are not of those who shrink back. The next thing Jesus says in Matthew 10, 39, so this is verse 39, whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So giving up your old ways, giving up your your old life that, that was following sin, giving that up for the sake of Christ and holding fast to your faith in him while you're in the secure hands of the Father, That leads to, eventually, after death, that leads to eternal life with Christ, right? There's good things to come, pleasures forevermore. All, Jesus forever, right? It's so good. But finding or staying with that old life, that old life of sin, giving up Jesus for it, that means you'll lose that life that matters, right? The eternal life. You can't, Keep your life here on earth, right? Everyone dies. Eventually, your life will be taken away from you anyway. So to give that life over to Jesus for his sake, for his cause, well, that's a pretty smart move, really. It's like Jim Elliott's famous quote. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose, which is, of course, eternal life, forever life. This quote echoes the words of Jesus himself in Mark 8.36. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul, lose his soul? Going after the things of the world, the things that your flesh wants that are against the things of God, or even just going after good things and neglecting God because you're going so far after the good things that aren't necessarily good or bad. If you're going after the world, if, you know, you're just living for success, living for your pleasure, it's not worth it, right? It's fleeting. It all goes away, right? And what's left is the judgment of God. Don't forfeit your soul for the world. Before sending them out, Jesus finishes his teaching to his disciples by saying, In verses 40 and 42, whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he's a disciple, truly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. You can sense in these words the, uh, the care that Jesus wants us to have for people, right? Like when we were talking about, you know, family, like what we said earlier, you know, Jesus is not, of course, not saying 
that they're not important. Jesus is not saying to neglect them, right? Care for them. And the same thing for people, other people. Care for other people. People are important. They're so important. Why would Jesus die for people if they weren't important, right? People are so important. And this text shows us that. But ultimately, again, what our passage today in full is trying to tell us is that Jesus is the most important. So relying on his Holy Spirit, keep him as your first love. Bow with me in prayer. Lord, you are good to us. And I've said that so many times, so many times. Lord, you're so good. You're so good. And it's so true, though. Like, I couldn't say that enough. I couldn't say that enough. You are so good to us. You, especially, especially when we think of your death for us, that you came down from being God Almighty. You came down, you took on our form, human, lowly human. And not only that, you went through the humiliation and the complete agony, the unimaginable agony of dying on the cross. You did that for us so that we could be saved. And I I think that's so amazing. And it's the greatest act of love. And I thank you so much for that. And I thank you for your power, for your resurrection, that because you rose again, that we can also rise again to eternal life after we die. That's so good. And I just thank you too that what do we need in order to uh, enter heaven, in order to get eternal life? Do we need to work super hard? Do we have to do all these good things and keep up with it? No, that's impossible. What do we have to do? We have to believe in you and what you've done. And if, and if that's done in the right way, if there's repentance involved in that, true repentance, if our faith is genuine, then you do save us. And we can hold that. We can hold to that. We are confident in that. And that's amazing, God. <sighs> You are so good to us in every way. And just help us to continue to to see that always so that we want to live our lives for you, so that we want to serve you in all that we do. Because we remember, wow, how, how much did Jesus serve me? It's amazing. You did so much for us while you were God. But also we want to take into account, too, that we need to serve you well. You know, we want to serve you well. We don't want to take what you've done for us and just throw it in the dirt. No, we want to do well for you. We want to live well for you. So just help us to do that, Lord. Please help us to do that. And, uh, yeah, just help us again to remember you are the greatest. Help us not to get too distracted by all these other things in life. Help us to be focused on you as we live and, again, to live our lives for you fully. In the name of Jesus, amen.